but you have it there, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So, okay. Welcome everyone to our first uh, webinar. Uh, we're in our new space now, Rise Baking Lab. Um, it is mostly finished. It's got a little bit work to do and- We're close, Dan. We're close <laughs> and we're here, we're working. It's awesome. Um, oh, is that our, we're making bread at the same time. Check we're gonna see if it's proofed enough. So, um, so here we go. So what I'm going to try to do is just make Baker's Math uh, simple in a way that you can make your own recipes or understand other recipes. So the whole point of Baker's Math is just to be able to compare the recipes, be able to scale your recipes to different amounts. Um, you know, no, no bakers are, well, no professional bakers are, you know, measuring five cups of this and, you know, two tablespoons of that. It doesn't work in a, in a, in a big bakery. And it's actually not that great for a home bakery um, or baking at home. Uh, everything you should be doing is by weight. I would suggest by doing it by grams. Uh, if you're in the States, you might be doing pounds and ounces, but it's a lot easier if you're just using grams. It's a little more straightforward because you're not having to worry about the ounces and pounds and all that kind of stuff. So get yourself a scale and that's the starting point. This doesn't work without a scale. Um, so it doesn't have to be an expensive scale, a scale that measures to the gram ideally um, and a scale that measures, it depends how much bread you wanna make, You know, a scale that will measure up to maybe 10 kilograms or something like that would be good. Um, more if you're making more, or it can just be a little bit less. You, you know, you can get a $20 star frit scale uh, at the store. It doesn't have to be fancy. If you want to get a little bit more into it, um, this is the, this is the best scale that that I think there is to to use at a base bakery. It's the San Jamara Scali. Uh, it's like maybe around $300. So if you're just baking at home, it's maybe a little bit overkill. The nice thing is it's got a really big platform and, and the, the platter comes off so you can wash it. It's pretty accurate. And there's two models, one that goes up to 33 pounds and one that goes up to 66 pounds. Also, it's very simple. A lot of these kind of scales have, you know, too many functions for what you need for just baking. And it also has numbers on both sides. So if you're two people baking, then you can both read the scale from each side. Anyway, that's good, but really just a $20 scale. If you're just at home making a few loaves of bread, you know, this would probably be a little overkill to spend that much money on a scale. But if you're making more than that um, and you want a really solid scale, this is good. The batteries last a really long time. You don't have to plug it in. Most of them, they die right away. Um, and you have to charge it every night and then you're stuck with no scale. So anyway, I love that one. That's kind of off topic, but there we go. <laughs> so once you've got your recipes weighed out, and I'm sure you've heard all the benefits of weighing, uh, for one thing, a cup of flour will be a different weight, no matter who scoops it. Um, and, and that sort of thing, it's just more accurate. And the other thing is it's a lot easier. So you put your bowl on the scale, you measure the one ingredient, you push tear, which is zeroed out, you measure the other ingredient, and then you're not using a whole bunch of different um, uh, containers to measure out your ingredients. So now that we've got that, what is the baker's math and baker's percentages? The way that it's all set up is that you start with a certain amount of flour, um, and then you compare the amount of every other ingredient to the total amount of flour. So you get weird, weird numbers sometimes because if you add up the total of the recipe, it comes to more than 100%. Because flour, we're always calling 100%. So it seems a little bit like percentage is not the exact right term. If you think about it as like 100 parts flour to how many parts other ingredients. So usually salt is in a range of around 2%. So if we say there's 2% salt, what we really mean is two parts salt for every hundred parts of flour. And if we say the water we're gonna have, which is also called the hydration, is at 65%, that means we have 65 parts of uh, water for a hundred parts of flour. And the flour is always 100. Uh, and we just call it percent. When you're calculating, if you use percentages to calculate, it works that way. So if you have two different types of flour, 
they add up to 100%. So let's say I wanted to use half whole wheat and half white. It would be 50% whole wheat, 50% white, but the total flour is still always 100%. That doesn't change no matter what. So everything else is based around that. So you pick a, an amount of flour that you want to use, and then you're going to calculate the rest of the recipe based on that. And that's that's just the, the very basics of how it works. Now, there's very simple recipes. You just got flour, water, salt, and yeast, and they're, they're straight up. Or you have other recipes where you're adding other ingredients. You have a sourdough. You have a, a yeast pre-ferment. Um, and those are all complications that make the baker's mouth a little harder. Um, another thing I'm sure a lot of people are going to say, hey, that's not how you do it. Um, <laughs> There's every baker I go to and work with has their own slight variation on how this works. Um, this is the method that I use that I think kind of makes the most sense. The base, the basics of this hundred percent and 70% water. That's, that's pretty straightforward. Everybody uses that the same, but when it starts to come to calculating the uh, Levan for your sourdough or other things like that, um, those calculations are a little bit different and I use something that's slightly different than other people do. Um, so let's just start out and I'll, I'll go over to the board here and we'll just calculate a very simple recipe um, and you'll see how this works. So when I'm starting out here, um, you're, right now I'm just gonna pick an amount of flour um, and, and, and work with that. I, ideally, what you want is a total amount of dough, and I'll show you that later, how to calculate the exact size of the dough you want. Um, but to make it really easy, I'm going to base it on 1,000 grams of flour, because then the percentages are really easy, because 60% of 1,000 is 600, 2% uh, of 1,000 is 20, and the calculations are very simple. So we can do a few calculations like this and see. First, I'll put in some percentages. and. What I want you to be able to do by the end of this is to be able to create your own recipe. So I don't walk around with a, for bread, I don't have any recipes. I literally don't have a recipe book. Um, it's just all the percentages and I know what range everything comes to. So I'll give you a really simple recipe and then we'll talk about what kind of ranges these percentages are. And then you just, you, you know, you, you pick what percentage you want. You want more water, you want more oil. Um, certain things have to stay very, uh, pretty much the same, like salt is always around 2%, sometimes up to two and a half percent, sometimes a little bit less, um, but there's a certain amount where it just, that's that's the writing of the salt. It'll taste too salty, or if there's not enough salt, it just tastes bad. So let's start with one very simple calculation. So I'm gonna start with a um, thousand grams of flour, or a kilogram of flour. And here I'm just, assuming we're just using one type of flour. So this is going to be, in the baker's percentage, 100%. And as I always say, it's, it's more like 100 parts flour. So the next thing that I'm gonna add is some water. Um, and so if I want the water to be, let's say we're doing um, just a regular, say, sandwich loaf or something, then it's usually somewhere between maybe 60, 65%. So I'm going to say 65%. So now for every 100 parts of uh, flour, I'm going to have 65 parts of water. So 165% times 1,000 will give us 650 grams of water. And the other thing we always need is salt. And like I said, it's usually around 2%. I'll give you ranges for all these so you can make your own recipes. 2% uh, would be 20. 2% of 1,000 is 20. If I have 20 grams of salt, and since this is just a straight dough, I need something to leaven the bread, and so it's going to be yeast. Yeast is kind of variable, usually anywhere from very little to like 0.1% up to usually the max is around 2%. It starts kind of not tasting great after 2% and it rises really fast. But if you want a loaf of bread that's gonna be ready, you know, it's gonna proof for an hour and then you put it in the pan in an hour and you bake it, then you're gonna use something like 2%. So let's just say we're gonna use 2%. And I am always using instant yeast. 
this is a whole nother topic. You can use fresh yeast. Uh, you can use active dry yeast, but I would never use active dry yeast. Um, and I'll get into that later. Instant yeast always has the same leavening power, no matter what, if you store it properly. Seal it up tight. And if you're using it regularly, put it in the fridge. If you're using it for a long time, it lasts. Like I put yeast in the freezer, sealed up tight, pulled it out a year later, still works just as well. Um, whereas with fresh yeast, um, if you're a home baker, you are going to have a hard time getting through a pound of fresh yeast. But every day, the leavening power goes less and less. So unless you're a baker who's constantly getting in fresh yeast and, and mixing it up and using a whole bunch, um, it's not ideal. You can give it and, and try it. It's kind of fun to do. But it's a little less reliable um, as it because if your yeast is five days old, it's going to give you less leavening than if it's just one day old um, and so forth. And if you go buy it, you don't know actually how old it already is. It was, it, did they just get it an hour later? Anyway, that's too much about yeast. So I'm, when I'm talking about yeast all day today, I'm going to be talking about instant yeast. The percentage range for fresh yeast and active dry are different just because they have a different density of how much yeast is in there. So we'll say 2% yeast, which will be all again, 20 grams. And so there I have my recipe. Now, where things get a little bit weird is your total recipe, if I were to add up these percentages, since I'm starting with 100, the total recipe is going to be more than 100%, which it seems a little weird for people, but this will add up to 169%. And what that means is for every 100 parts of water, we're gonna have 169 parts of dough. So we have, you always end up with more dough than you have flour because you're adding all the other ingredients to it. And then if I'm gonna add up all my ingredients here, I'm going to have, just because of the thousand works out well, that's 1690 grams. And so this would be great for, this would be ending up being two 845 gram loaves. So this is a very simple uh, recipe just for a straight dough that you're putting the yeast right in and you've got the basic ingredients here. Now, if I wanted to change it around and, and say, ah, I want uh, some honey in there. Well, yeah, I'll give you ranges for these type of things, but let's say I'm gonna put in 5% honey. Then all I'm gonna do here, 5% of 1,000 is 50. And when I'm looking at this, there's certain ingredients that are going to make the dough wetter and, and there's certain ingredients that are going to make the dough drier. So if I added, let's say, dry oats to this, it's going to soak up a lot of the water in the, in the recipe. So you have to compensate for that. If I add honey to it, it's going to make the dough seem wetter and a little bit looser. Um, also, the sugar affects the dough as well. So when you're adding these all up, you have to kind of think, well, oh, like it, it's a, that's the more complicated part when you're compensating for the extra ingredients you're adding. But I'll give you ranges on how you can do that. So now I have my 50 grams of honey and I have this recipe. Um, and you can go, go on like that. You could have all kinds of ingredients going on there, but that's the basic of how it works. So one question I always get, because I'm always doing these high hydration doses, it's like millions of times saying, you know, you can't be 116% hydration because you can't be more than 100%. But it just means there's 116 parts of water for 100 parts of flour. So you've got um, more water than flour. So anyway, that's the basic of how it works. Um, and as I said, grams is a much easier way to calculate these. Um, and when you're looking at a recipe, if you if you're if you're trying to compare, um, a lot of good recipes will have them in percentages. Um, if they don't, you can put it into your own percentage to scale it up. So let's say I had the the uh, a recipe like this, where I've got you look at your recipe, you've got 500 grams of flour. I'm just doing this on the fly, so hopefully my math is good. Okay, and I've got uh, 300 grams of water. This is just a made up totally recipe. 
Um, I've got 10 grams of salt and uh, let's say five grams of yeast. So you look up your recipe online and this is what you got. Um, if you don't know, if the recipe comes in cups and that sort of thing, it's easy to find a, a, um, a conversion table online. Well, it's also very easy to ask ChatGPT uh, to convert it all. Um, so if you say, how much does a cup of flour weigh? And it's 130 grams, depends on its whole liter weight, it changes a little bit. And the water and the salt. Sometimes when you're at home, if you don't have a scale that measures really accurately, you're also gonna want some volume measurements for really small ingredients. Like if your scale won't measure five grams, then you're gonna have to know how many teaspoons that works out to. But you just look that up. Now, if I if I wanted to um, change the amount of these, you could you could double it or you could um, triple it with with those. But if I have another recipe, and let's say it's um, at the same time, I'm going to compare these two recipes. I've got 500 uh, and grams of flour. I'm going to start with the same, so it's a little bit easier. And I've got 325 grams of water. And then I've got, I'm going to do the same amount of salt. I already know that that's 2%. That's why I'm keeping it that way. Um, and 10 grams of yeast. So you can see these are pretty similar recipes. I mean, all bread is pretty similar recipes. They're water, flour, salt, yeast, or they're sourdough. And just very small variations in the amount. Some are wetter, some are drier. Some have a little bit more yeast, some have a little less. That's the difference in almost every bread recipe. There's, there's not really that much to it. So if I were to turn these into, into percentages, what I would have to do, um, the flour, like I said, is always going to be 100%. So for both of these, the flour is 100%. I'm gonna try not to get too crazy in the math. I'm, I want, want this idea to be simple. So if this part's a little challenging to calculate these, um, it's, this is as intense as the math is gonna get right now. So in order to, to figure out a percentage, you divide uh, what you have, the, the water, by the total of flour. So you divide this by the 100% flour. So 300 divided by 500 um, is going to end up being 60%. Um, at least it's gonna check my math part of it. Yeah, 300 divided by 500 is gonna turn out to be 0 0.6, which is 60%. To convert from your decimals, you have 0 0.6. As I said, don't worry, I'm not gonna talk like Corey math the whole time. But if you have 0 0.6, um, that's 300 divided by 500. To convert it into a percentage, you just move the decimal place twice. So that's 60%. Um, you can also multiply it by 100, but that's the same thing. Just move the decimal place twice, and you don't have to worry about that extra calculation. If you divide it and it's 0 0.05, and I move the decimal place two times, then I have 5%. Um, so you get pretty good at doing, doing that. So this is 100%. This is going to work out to be 60%. This is going to work out to be 20%. 10 divided by 500 is 0 0.02. And then I move the decimal place. I forgot when you're going to 2%. Ends up to 2%. And this is going to end up being 1%. And if I do the exact same calculation for this recipe, 325 divided by 500 is going to give you. Uh, 65%, if it's 325 divided by 500 is 0 0.65, and I times it by 100 or multiply, and I end up with 65%. This is the same, so that's going to be 2%, and as I said, yeast salt is almost always around 2%, and then I have 10 grams of yeast, which in this case is going to be, um, well, so 10 divided by 500 is going to give us 2%. And you can just see these are the same numbers, 10 and 10. It's going to obviously work out to the same part. part. So now the benefit of this, there's two. One, I can see, aha, 
65% hydration, 60% hydration. So this is a drier dough than that one by 5%. And it's good to start seeing. So you make this recipe and you say, oh, 65%. And you know how that one turned out and how it feels and how moist it was. And so when you make the 60%, you can, you can then say, okay, this is kind of what 60% uh, water is going to be like. Same salt. And this one has twice as much yeast, 2% yeast. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit later, but you can judge how fast it's gonna rise by how much yeast you put in. Obviously more yeast is gonna rise a lot faster. We can have more precise timing for that. So if I want a, a recipe that's going to be ready in like four hours, I'm gonna use 1%. If I want it to be ready in two hours, I'm gonna use 2%. I'll give you some ranges, um, but that's just the basic for straight dough with no additives, no, um, no silker, no, um, sourdough and that sort of thing. So that's how these all work. Um, and yeah, so that's the basic. So now what we need to talk about is just the basic ranges of what everything's going to be. Um, and we'll talk about just the main ingredients. So water, Uh, the lowest water in any recipe is usually somewhere around 40%. Bagels is probably the driest dough. That's 40 to 45%. Uh, sometimes people put a little bit more, but if you want that dense chewiness, um, it's going to be that low. If you make a loaf of bread out of that, it's going to be like a bagel for the whole loaf. It's going to be a lot hard to eat. So the low end of water is about 40%. And then for regular, like kind of old fashioned, you know, you're making a tin loaf and that sort of thing, or just sandwich bread, that usually goes up to about 65% as the most. And then as you get into sourdough and ciabatta, you can go as high as, um, you know, 120% um, that your average beginner kind of sourdough recipe starts around 70%. And we usually make our sourdough around 90 to 95% um, hydration. And so that's the range all the way up to 120. But your basic, um, your basic bread loaves are gonna be more in the 65% range and for sourdough, maybe a little higher in the 70s. Now, your second ingredient is that you're gonna worry about is salt. Now, there are only very few breads that don't have salt in it. There's some Italian breads that have no salt in it. They also have no flavor. Um, there's the one bread that is actually good that has no salt is, is Montreal style bagels. Uh, surprisingly, there's, there is no salt in a proper Montreal style bagel. Yeah. Gary is wondering about the temperature of water and if you will be covering blooming. Uh, yeah, give me a minute. I'll talk, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that right now. Um, it's a little else. So what happens with the temperature of the water is just in the calculation of your timing. So that's a little takes a little bit more more to know. But if you know if I want my my um, dough to rise faster, I'm going to use warmer water. Dough to rise cooler, slower. I'm going to use cooler water. When you're hydrating yeast, which you should always do, um, even instant yeast, the instructions say just put it right into the flour. Uh, it's definitely, you should be hydrated first with water that's around 30 degrees. If you hydrate the yeast in very cold water, it will be really delayed in activating and your rise will be very slow. Um, I don't, you don't need to bloom instant yeast. Um, you do that for uh, active dry yeast. The particles are really big. They have to dissolve and activate before they go in. So usually that's a bit of warm water and a bit of sugar. I never use active dry yeast. That's a, you know, nobody wants to be warming up and dissolving. It's just, it's a pain in the butt where the instant yeast, you just stir into the water, you're done, and you start mixing. But always do it uh, in a portion of warmer water. Um, that's kind of going to get a little bit farther than, than we need to be on that. But anyway, just use instant yeast. It's way better. Um, and there's lots of calculations for how to, how to convert. Um, just look up online the difference, the calculation for instant yeast and active dry yeast. Great um, question, Gary, thank you. Um, okay, now salt, as I said, Montreal soda bagels are 0%. I can't think of any other bread really that's low like that, that uh, 
taste good. They, the Montreal bagels taste good because they have honey in them. They're boiled in honey water. There's eggs in them. Um, so that gives you that kind of sweetness and the flavor, plus the way that they're baked. The crust gets a lot of flavor and, and whatever's on them. Um, not everybody makes them with zero salt, but that's kind of the original way um, that sets them apart. I usually put a little bit of salt in, to be honest, but um, there you go. So salt is anywhere from, you know, the most recipes that I see are anywhere from 1.8 to 2.5. There's some pizza places that use like 3% or more. Uh, that's getting pretty high. I don't, I don't usually like to go beyond 2.5 and I usually use something now. I was always 2%. Now I kind of like it a little more like 2.2%. 2, 2. These are pretty subtle differences in the, in the amounts. So only be a couple grams of, of salt. So you've got that. So you can decide how salty do I want it. Not very salty, 1.8. Pretty salty, 2.5. You also have to take into consideration that the salt does more than make it salty. Uh, salt inhibits the yeast growth. So as you go higher, you're going to uh, slow down the growth of yeast, but you're also going to strengthen the dough because the salt draws water from the gluten and tightens it up. So there's different different effects that that's going to have. But really, if you're just baking at home, uh, you know you're not on a tight schedule. You, you're not going to have to worry too much about it. It's not like it's going to take twice as long with 2.5 percent. So that's the range for salt, um, fats, which could be oil. Butter, lard, um, anything like that, you know, you can go from 0%, which is just a, a lean dough with nothing. 30% um, is starting where a brioche is. And all the way up to 50%. Um, it's a pretty high range of of uh, oil, you definitely got to make something like that in a mixer. You're gonna have a hard time mixing in uh, half, like half as much of the flour as oil. That's a lot, um, but it can be done in a mixer and make a great bread. You have a question? Paul Johnson says that yeah. he uses three percent salt. That's very high. Um, I find that tastes a little too salty, but people do do use three percent salt. It also will kind of slow down your fermentation a little bit. Um, it also depends what you're using the bread for. If it's just eating bread, you're just going to like dip it in oil and eat it, then 3% is probably fine. If you're going to maybe make a sandwich out of it, this 3% will kind of take away from the other flavors of the sandwich. If you're making a pizza and you're putting salty toppings on and you have 3%, that's going to be too much salt. But if you want to put a uh, sauce that, that doesn't have a lot of salt in it and toppings that don't have a lot of salt, then maybe 3% is okay. Um, but for me, I try to stick... I, for flavor and, and most bread, just plain bread is usually below 2.5%. 2, 2 um, so that's the fat that you can add. Sugar, I mean, this can be all over the map as well. Um, you know, usually you're in, in the zero to ah, maybe around 15%. That would be a very sweet um, dough. This will also affect a lot of things. The sugar uh, at a high level really slows down the fermentation. Um, it makes the dough seem really wet um, and changes, but somewhere in that range. Also, if you're using your yeast um, with a high amount of sugar, you usually use a different type of yeast that's called osmotolerant yeast um, that does well in the uh, high sugar concentration. The sugar draws water out of the yeast cells and, and they don't grow very well. So you need a special yeast that, that resists that. Um, and then, other ingredients um, I like to add, like add-ins, like such as um, cheese, raisins, fruit. Um, I'm usually adding those in. Um, so this is where things get a little bit um, tricky is that some people will calculate add-ins as a percentage of the total dough weight. So if I, you know, like in our previous example, we ended up having 1,690 grams of total dough. So a lot of people will say, okay, I'm gonna add 50% of the total dough weight in there. But that would be very different than 50% of the total flour weight. It would be significantly more. Um, so I like to keep absolutely everything relative to the flour because the dough weight depends on a lot of different things. If it's a wetter dough, um, you're, you're gonna have still the same amount of flour, but more dough. And so your calculations 
not going to be quite right because you want it relative to the flour because the flour is determining kind of how much ingredients you want to add. So add-ins, um, I calculate based off flour and I go anywhere up to 50%. Um, usually I'm going to be somewhere in the range of 15 to 50%. And this is a complicated by you've got to determine sometimes they're really wet. So let's say I wanted to put apples in the dough. When I put that in the dough and I bake it, they're going to release a ton of water. So that's really going to change the, the hydration of your dough and you're going to get soggy things. So generally wet things, I try to dehydrate a little bit before I go, um, before I use them. Um, or if I know it's going to be a really wet ingredient that I'm going to add, let's say, you know, I'm adding cherries or, um, something like that, then I'll decrease the amount of hydration. So say my recipe was originally 65% and I'm going to add a wet ingredient then I'll say, oh, let's try 60% because there's a lot that those are wet, wet ingredients. Whereas if I'm adding something that's really dry, like oats, what I'll usually do is make a porridge beforehand to, to, so that it's not really dry. If you just add oats to your, to your um, dough, it'll suck all the water out of the dough and it'll be very dry. So certain things you're going to want to soak beforehand or make a porridge, and, and that's going to um, account for the extra water that they're going to absorb. But there is a little bit of play that you could, you'll have to do there. And you'll make it one time and think, oh, i got to take the water back next time because that added a lot of water or took a lot of water away. But if I'm adding cheese in there, I mean, I usually will be somewhere maybe around 25% of the flour weight. Um, and you can see, once you get up really high to 50%, you're gonna change your loaf a lot. You're not gonna quite get the same big tall loaf because that's gonna be all weighing the, the dough down, but I like lots of stuff in the bread too. So that's something that I think Luis has a question here. Antonio is asking if he uses a solid sourdough instead of a liquid sourdough, does he have to increase the yeah. hydration? Uh, I will get to that in a minute. I'm gonna go over and show you, I have, uh, I'll show you how I calculate these on a spreadsheet. I'm just kind of doing these as some basic calculations. I have a calculator. So we're doing a course uh, that's gonna be coming out. It's actually released tonight. Um, that's on uh, a high hydration ciabatta dough, the one that's, you know, everybody's probably seen the video of that one. Um, and it's, it's, it's applicable to any type of high hydration dough. But with that course, I'm gonna be um, also providing the uh, a calculator that you can use and you can calculate um, just straight dough, or you can calculate a dough with a, a poolish, or you can calculate a dough with a sourdough starter. Um, and so that'll be available. If you take the course, we'll have it ready for that and, and you'll be able to download that with the course. Um, so yeah, check that out if you are interested in figuring out how to, how, how to mix wetter doughs. Um, that'll be a really great course for you because it's, it's, it's definitely takes a certain technique of mixing um, you know, everybody says, you know, oh, how are you touching that dough? It's not sticking everywhere. And why is my dough not like that? And why is my dough so loose? It has to do with the method that we use for mixing. It's really the key to be able to get a lot of water in. And, you know, you've probably heard my spiel before, but more water, your bread lasts longer. I like the custardy kind of texture that you get in. Um, you know, you buy it, if you've ever made a loaf of bread and then the next day it's like stale, that's because you haven't put enough water in it. And that's like basically every old recipe for bread and lots of new recipes for bread. There's not nearly enough water in them. And that's because it's, it's it takes a little bit more skill to, to get more water in there. But I feel like you end up with a better bread that way. Um, so anyway, that's what I'm doing for that. Um, and I'll show you that calculator in a minute. It's it's in a just in a spreadsheet form, but we're in the process of making it into more like a web app that we can use. Um, okay, so that's the basics for how we're gonna make these recipes. So if I'm, if I'm gonna say, okay, I'm going to make just a regular white bread. Um, and as I said, kind of most of your, your regular sandwich bread recipes are in the 65%. So let's say now, this is something I also haven't covered, is if you want two types of flour, they have to add up to 100%. So if I have 100% flour total, then my, in my two flours have to add up to 100%. So let's say I like to often use like a 30% whole grain. So I'm gonna say 30% einkorn, which is an amazing flour if you haven't used it. It's, a, it's an ancient grain. 
tastes great. The color is beautiful. It doesn't have quite the same bitterness as a lot of uh, varieties of old wheat will have. It is wheat. Um, that's a you know, the ancient grain spell wheat. Corazon, they're wheat. Um, so if you can't eat wheat, you these all have gluten in them. Anyway, so then I'm left with seventy percent to make up my hundred percent, and I will make that just white flour. I'm keeping it simple for here. Okay, so here's my basic. I got. I'm not worrying about how many grams I have. I'm just thinking about the percentages. So uh, here's my flour. And now I want to think, okay, a sandwich loaf, you know, 60% is probably a lot of recipes. I like to do it at least 65%, but then I'm going to think maybe I want to add some other things to this, or maybe instead of um, water, I want to use milk. Um, there's a consideration to make that it's very hard to dissolve uh, yeast into cold milk, almost impossible. But if you warm up the milk to dissolve the yeast in it and then make it in a mixer, uh, the dough will get too hot. Anyway, I'm not gonna get too, too complicated with that, but let's say I'm gonna use milk for the hydration, which is totally fine. Um, you could use you could use a number of different things. You could use cream for the hydration, which makes it actually amazing bread. Um, obviously it's a slight difference because there are some solids in cream. That's, I wouldn't worry too much about that. So let's say I wanna use milk and I'm gonna use 60% uh, because I'm gonna add some other wet ingredients instead of 65%, so 60% milk. Um, and then I'm going to add in my 2% salt. That's pretty standard, 2%. I left, instead of doing 65%, I did 60%. And I'm going to now, instead of um, making this 65%, I, I kept it low intentionally because I'm going to put 5% eggs in there. And obviously, eggs are going to make the dough wetter. Again, there's solids, and they do change the dough a little bit. But just on average, you can kind of calculate it like that. I've got 5% more wet ingredients. You can go really complicated. OK, I'm going, i got to speed up here. You can go really complicated, but let's just say that. So 5% eggs and 2% yeast. And then this is, this is my basic formula. So I start with, out with whichever amount of flour that I'm going to have. So if I want, you know, 800 grams of flour, then I'm going to do 60% of 800 grams, which is, I don't know, I can put that really fast, 2% uh, salt, so 2% of 800, 5% of 800, 2% of 800, and that will be the recipe that I make. Um, so that's, that's it's, it's that easy to kind of come up with a recipe. Um, if I don't want eggs, like maybe, or maybe I want to add some sugar. Um, I'll add 5% uh, sugar. Sugar is good to add, um, not because of the sweetness, but sugar draws moisture into the into the bread and keeps it fresh for a lot longer. Anyway, this is the deal. I'm going to move on to the little, little um, spreadsheet that I have. Hopefully everybody's still hanging along and I'm not doing this too boringly for you. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen here. After I hydrate, uh, ring the alarm. Shout out North Paw um, Brewing. Luis's dad, yeah, works for this brewery, North Paw, here in Vancouver. Fantastic. Check it out. It's very good beer. We're not being paid by that. It's just really good beer. <laughs> um, so I'm going to screen, share my screen here, and this is this is a, a basic version of what this calculator looks like. Um, and here we can calculate. So I have straight dough, which is um, what you um, have when you don't have a pre-ferment or anything like that. So this one I have option for three different flours um, and the total always ends up to 100%. And then you just add in percentage for the rest of these. So let's say somebody says, oh, I want a bread with uh, einkorn and rye and, and white. So let's say flour one, I'm gonna say einkorn. I'm gonna do einkorn, 30%. We always say that, I don't know why. <laughs> Um, and then my next one's going to be rye. I'm going to put in 10% rye. And then to make up 100%, I still need 60 more. So, oops, not 650. 60% just uh, white flour. Now, there's way more to flour than white flour. We have, I yes. think, like a dozen different types of white flour here. So <laughs> um, that's a whole nother topic. That actually is, is next week. Next week's seminar, we're going to do a whole... Um, one of these webinars, all on different types of flour, choosing your flour, 
how they work, how to use them in recipes. So look out for that one. Um, okay, but anyway, here we go. I've chosen my flour. Um, I'm gonna do the water at 65%. I'm gonna do the salt at 2.2. And I'm gonna put in yeast at um, 1%. Now, the cool thing about this calculator is that I choose, uh, for example, here we have the loaf is 850 grams and we want 25 loaves. So that gives us a total weight of 21, uh, 21,250. And this will calculate all the amounts you need now. So if I wanted two loaves at 900 grams, then it recalculates everything for you. So now your total is 1800. And these are the amounts of each ingredient that you need to use. So 300 grams of iron corn, roughly. Anyways, you can see the idea there. Now, where they get a little bit more complicated is when you're talking about sourdough. Um, so the sourdough, um, you take part of the flour and you pre-ferment it with a sourdough culture. And there's different ways of, of calculating how much flour. So some people will calculate the amount of levain relative to the total dough weight. That's pretty common, but not a great way to do it because Let's say you're doing 100% hydration or 60% hydration. That's a huge difference in how much dough you have, but still the same amount of flour. So I always calculate pre-ferment or your levain or, or whatever as a percentage of the total flour instead of a percentage of the total dough, because the different hydration and different ingredients are going to make a different amount of total dough, but you're still having the same amount of flour. And really, I want to pre-ferment a percentage of the flour. So what I do for this, um, for a more complicated one, the sourdough, um, is I'm going to calculate that I want to use 20% of the total flour in a sourdough levain. That's kind of general for me. I usually use anywhere from 15 to 20% of the total flour in the levain. So on this one, you just type in 20% um, and it, it actually calculates the amount of pre-ferment you need. Um, the, the recipe works the same. Um, this is like a sourdough recipe. Now we got 2.2% salt, 72% water. And then what you have on the end is this, is this is what you have to make for your sourdough starter. And then these are the ingredients you mix in for your final dough. This, is, this, this, cal this um, column is basically the total formula minus what you put everything in the levain and and that that's what you're going to mix for the final dough and you can see the levans in there so that's how that works now if you want to do this um i'm oh, sorry I'm, I'm not on my screen am i still sharing screen yeah 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 okay so if you want to do this by hand i'll show you how to do that because uh you probably don't have this calculator yet and i'm not ready to send this one out yet so let me just do a quick calculation of how you would work out a sourdough um Thing. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Yeah, come over here. So let's go back to the to the um, the example where we're using a thousand grams because so it's just easier to demonstrate. So here I'm going to have 100 percent flour, 70 uh, percent water, 2 uh, percent. So this is just a basic sourdough. So there's no, no yeast in there. So if I have a thousand grams of flour, I'm gonna have, hopefully you can read this. I don't have a remarkable penmanship. Uh, I'm gonna have 700 <laughs> grams of water. And I'm gonna have 20 grams of salt. So now this calculation is a lot easier also if you do it based on the total flour. So I say I want to I want to I want to pre-ferment 20% of the flour in a levain. So 20% of a thousand is 200 grams of flour. And then your standard levain is 100% hydration. So I would have to use the same amount of flour as water. So if I just do a regular liquid levain, then I need 200 grams of water so that they're equal parts flour and water. That's the usual. Some people will do a drier one. What was the what was the questionnaire? You used 60% or 50%? Uh, no, they decided they were using a uh, solid sourdough. Yeah. yeah. So so a stiff sourdough starter, let's say it's 60%. So 60% of two of uh, 200 is 120. 
So if, the, if this is 100%, um, but if I do a 60% migration starter, then I need 120 grams of water. Um, most of you are probably using a 100% or a lip of the band, um, but a dry one is anywhere from 50 to 60%. Uh, I'll get into that detail later. Um, not later, another time. So if I have this and I put 200 grams of the flour in the um, in the Levan and 200 grams of water in the Levan, then for my final dough, I have to subtract that from the total. So my final dough, once I add the Levan, I have to account for that because otherwise I'm just adding extra flour and water to it. So from my 1,000, I take away the 200 that I put in there and I have 800 grams of flour. I have 700 grams of water. So for this one, now I'm gonna take away 200 grams of water. So that means I'm gonna have 500 grams of water. If it was the other one where I was doing a dry one and I was only using 120 grams, then I just take only 120 grams away from 700. So whatever amount of flour and water are in the van can have to be subtracted from the total formula. And then the 20 grams of salt, there's no salt in there, so it's still 20 grams of salt. So you mix up this levan. Now, it depends would you uh, feed it or um, how fast you need to go, how much your seed you're gonna put in this levan. I'm not gonna worry too much about that right now. Um, this is just the basics of, of calculating it. And then once I mix that up, I'm gonna mix the, the remaining water, flour, and salt into that uh, for the final dough. That's the basics. So, um, it, it can all be done by hand. And this way you can see, like you can you can do anything. You can say, oh, I only want to put in, let's try just mixing 10% of the flour in the van and have less the van, uh, maybe have a more mild flavor, but you're going to have to um, let it ferment for a lot longer. So that's, that's the basic way to calculate all that stuff. Um, I hope that kind of answers a lot of the questions that people have. Um, and now we will just... Uh, I think have a bit of time for some questions. I don't know. Uh, hopefully I've touched on a lot of, of what you need. And as I said, um, in our in our high hydration um, Shibata course that's coming out, we will touch, a, we'll go way more in depth on a lot of these um, um, topics and we'll have the calculator there um, that you can use. We'll have that ready. Um, so you can calculate all your different recipes. Um, now I will just take some questions from people. Hopefully you made through that and it wasn't... Uh, too um boring uh it's math but the the great thing is you can make any amount you can say oh, i want to make a uh, ton of bread you're going to use five kilograms of flour or if you're you know sometimes we'll have a recipe with 40 kilograms of flour so that's that's the idea and you can easily scale it and compare and make your own recipes once you know the ranges um and you'll ex you'll experiment you like this range of water i like this range of of sugar. So somebody says, Oh, I want a brioche dough. And I'm going to say, okay, I want 30% of a fat. Let's do butter and maybe put in 10% sugar. I'm going to put in my usual 2.2% salt or 2% salt. And usually it's going to be a drier dough because you have so much oil. So maybe it'll be 55% uh, H2L. So anyway, there you go. Janet is asking, mm -hmm. is presuming a bigo works the same as a low bed. Yes. So here I've been talking about sourdough. You can do it the exact same way where 20% of the flour is in um, a poolish, which is the like a liquid levan. It's 100% hydration. Or a biga, which is 60, 50 to 60% hydration. And it's the exact same. So, you know, you'd have the 200 grams of flour in the in the biga. And if it was 60%, you'd have 120 grams of water in the biga. And you have to take that away from the master recipe for your final dough. Yes. Uh, Crystal is asking, what is the benefit of using pre-fermented dough versus just 20% of the bed? So there's many different pre-ferments. Um, you can have, uh, we're going to do another webinar on that as well. So you have Poolish and Biga, um, which are just yeast uh, and water and flour. You could have um, old dough, which is also called pate fermenté, where you take dough from the day before and you add it to the bread. Um, you can have a stiff sourdough, you can have a liquid sourdough. The whole idea is that you're adding a lot more flavor to the bread. Um, the, the fermenting that flour ahead of time um, gives you tons of flavor. You're getting a lot of fermentation happening ahead of time. Um, 
so that's that's the main factor. Also, I often use this for um, bakeries that need to have a, a quicker production. So what I do is you you pre-ferment a lot of the flour and then you can skip the bulk fermentation. So you go right from the mix to shaping and putting it in the pan. Um, so that's that's another benefit. Pre-ferments also have various effects on the dough as as a, as a, um, in terms of gluten development, that sort of thing. But we'll get into that after. Uh, Paul John Johnson is mm -hmm. saying that our example, it looks like the percentage of sourdough is 50%. 50%. In which example? The one that I did on the board? Yes. Um, so, the, so the total, so the total of, of, let's say our recipe was a total of 1,700 grams, not, not just the thousand of flour, but 1,700. So if you're if you're talking about the total dough, and you have um, you'd have 200 grams, two, um, 20 percent of the flour, 20 percent of the water in there, you'd have 400 grams. So it would be 400 divided by 1700. That's the total dough. If you're thinking about it that way, um, you'd end up end up with um, the total amount of levain to to the total dough as opposed to the total just the amount of flour that's pre-fermented so it, it actually ends up working to being not that different of a number but the 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 percentage of the total dough is always kind of changing depending on what your hydration and other ingredients are gary is asking if we mix hybrid diga and levain i do a lot of different pre-ferments um you know, a lot of people are are just hardcore sourdough or die, but um, yeast has a lot of benefits. Uh, it makes it changes the crust. You get a thinner, crispier crust. You get that kind of nuttiness um, um, from yeast. Whereas the sourdough, you get a, a depth of flavor. You get a longer shelf life. So a lot of things baguettes. I always use a poulish and a levain. Um, we've done pizza dough, both uh, it, really great with a, a Levan and Poolish or a Levan and a Biga. Um, you could use just a Biga. They have different flavors. The different hydration changes the fermentation and gives different flavors. Um, Gotta so ask, what's your favorite? My favorite? Uh, we, we just tend to use liquid Levan and Poolish. Yeah. <laughs> Part of the reason is I just find it easier to do. Um, some people like to mix up a big thing of, uh, of Biga, and then you hack a piece off and just throw it in there. I just like to mix it up and dump it into the mixer. Um, you know, generally when you're doing kind of production, you have to kind of think like kind of what's a little bit easier. And and the, I like the flavor a lot too. Um, but but definitely you can experiment and get different different flavors. I like to use them all. Different types of bread um, tend to tend to benefit more or less from from different um, pre ferments. And some are traditionally like a lot of Italian breads are using biga, um, and a lot of a lot of pizzerias use biga. Um, but it's it's really just a personal preference. Um, some things like if you use a poolish as as opposed to a biga, you'll have a more extensible dough. But that's a little more complicated. Uh, God, he's also asking about our desired dough temperature for high hydration. Mm -hmm. So, just about that. About that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the, the temperature of uh, generally when it, when it, most of the doughs I want to come off the mixer at around uh, twenty six degrees Celsius. Um, that's an ideal temperature for fermentation. Um, and not over 28 or 20. yeah, maximum 28, 29. If you get over that, your dough is going to be ruined. So yeah. what you have to consider when you're using a mixer is the more you mix, the hotter the dough goes. So you have to start with, with cold water so that by the end of mixing, you're going to get to warm water. If you're doing it by hand, it's going to raise a little bit because you've got your warm hands, but you don't really have the friction. So the temperature of your liquids, you know, will vary based on that. Um, but but generally, when I do the high hydration dough, we, we try to come off the mixer at 26 degrees Celsius. Panda crystal ciabatta, I don't know. Ciabatta is really, it was invented at like 80%. And now I'm making it at like 110% hydration. But the, the panda crystal tends to be like really... Uh, fine like ropiness inside um whereas the bread that i like to make as the ciabatta is more um more more custardy a little bit more rugged so that the individual um bubbles have a kind of a thicker um membrane to them and just just has that texture so yeah the the panda crystal tends to be more just like very light and not a lot of substance yeah um yeah, we got two minutes. 
Uh, Crystal, what's the room temperature? <laughs> oh, so <laughs> it ranges. Yeah, this is a big problem. Own. Like, yeah. so we're working with a pizza chain and one restaurant, you know, at night it's 15 degrees. The other restaurant at night, it's 26 degrees. And everything has to be mixed differently um, based on the room temperature. The easiest thing to do, there's calculations you can do. The easiest thing to do is just always take the temperature of dough at the end of mixing and then take the temperature of dough when you're done. And just kind of keep an eye on it and you'll get an idea. Oh, my house is pretty cool. This dough cools down really fast. When you're when you're baking at home, it's not as big of a deal. When you're baking at a bakery, you need your timing to be exact. So you have to be really careful about the about the timing. Crystal, our room temperature in our site, it depends. So when we're doing uh, pastry, we'll bring down the temperature mm -hmm. a lot. So everything's nice and cold and it's not as warm. And sometimes what we'll do is just, we have a, a proofer, so we'll stick the mm -hmm. dough in the proofer to keep it at the exact temperature we want. We'll set the proofer to 26 degrees and the dough stays there. Okay, we have to wrap up now. Okay. The last minute. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, thanks for joining us. This is really fun. We're going to do lots more of these. Uh, please check out our course that's coming out. Um, and also online on our website, we have tons of in-person courses coming out from um, beginner classes, advanced classes, baguettes, croissants, everything like that. So check out the website, risebakinglab.com and check out our new course. I think Luis put the link to the course in there, but you can always check it out on social media and, uh, yeah, please, uh, let your friends know. Thank you so much. Guys. Thanks. Have a great day. All right. Boom.